Okay, so today we're just starting off with what's called regression. So you're moving away completely from hypothesis testing. Please stop chatting those of you who are murmuring. Okay, so there's a little bit of hypothesis testing. It's a very small amount, but for the most part, the section is really interesting because it's very applied. So hopefully this is something you can see that, you know, you can actually use it in practice. It's not very abstract. So this is something where even if you go into the workplace, you know, this is something that your boss could ask you to do. So maybe a more complicated version. So this is the most basic version that we're going to start off with. And you'll do more complicated ones maybe later in your studies. Okay. So pretty much what regression is, is you're studying, you're interested in examining the relationship between variables. Okay. Sorry, let me change just to set up things here. Okay, so in a nutshell, the objective is to examine and evaluate possible relationships between variables. So you might have two variables that you are interested in, or maybe your boss is interested, or a client is interested in knowing, is there a connection between these two things? So, you know, in practice, maybe if you go into finance, you know that um, maybe the quality of a product will have an impact on a consumer's interest in your product. So those are two variables already, like how much is a person willing to spend? What are the things that influence people's behavior? What are the things that you know are related? So those are the kind of questions that you'll be able to answer with regression. Regression will also allow you to make maybe predictions. So if you know one variable, you can make a very educated guess about what the other variable should be under those circumstances. So here I just have a few examples. Um, of different variables that you might be interested in. So some, it's not always obvious that things are related, but these are straightforward cases here. So I have this variable age, so I take the age of a person and then I record their blood pressure. And naturally, I think there is a connection, I think, with age, like younger people tend to be in a certain range and older people in a certain range. So there's some connection there. So we want to find a way of quantifying it. And we already looked at um, correlation, which was one way. So you're going to see correlation is going to come up again. Oh, yeah, look at you guys. You guys are lucky. All right. So your tests are here. We'll deal with those. All right. Thank you. Everyone was like, can't see that. Well, okay. <laughs> okay. So we'll instruct you concerning this um, later. Okay. Another pair of variables, as an example, is your body fat and hours of exercise. So naturally, the someone who exercises more is more likely to have lower body fat than someone who doesn't exercise as much. So there's going to be a connection there. So typically, you're going to plot a graph. So hopefully, you're familiar with this. So for each and every person, you record the two variables, body fat and hours of exercise. And then you can go and plot those on a graph. So each of these little points here represents a person. So on the horizontal axis, I would have hours of exercise. And then on the vertical axis, I would have your body fat. And then each point here will be the corresponding um, eight hours of exercise and um, body fat. Okay, so there are two types of variables. Um, hopefully this is not too new to you. Have you heard of independent variables and dependent variables? How many of you are familiar with this concept in this context? Okay, so simply what we have here is we always have two variables, and then one of them will label it the independent variable, and the other one's going to be labeled the dependent variable. And um, pretty much what that means is the independent variable has an impact on the dependent one, and then naturally the dependent one is dependent on the independent one. So we'll put these in context with those examples just now. So when you plot your graph, the independent variable always goes on the horizontal axis, and the one that you've identified as your dependent variable goes on the vertical axis. So you always plot a graph in this way, and it'll be clear in the example if you just think about it, which way around they should go. And then before we look at these examples, um, sometimes the independent variable is called the predictor variable. Okay, and then also the dependent variable has these two other names. Sometimes we call it the response variable or we call it the outcome variable. 
All right, are we together still so far? All right, so it's just nice introductory stuff. So if you look at the first example, if I wanted to now classify age and blood pressure. So specifically, age is going to be the independent variable because that's what's going to have an influence on a person's blood pressure. But if you know a person's blood pressure, it doesn't necessarily tell you anything about their age. So you see the independent one has an impact on the other one. So it's not a two-way relationship. So if you think of it as I have a little sister, I influence my little sister, but my little sister doesn't influence me. So I'd be the independent variable, and she's the dependent one, pretty much. So how about this example of body fat and hours of exercise? Which one would you make the independent variable? How many of you say body fat? How many of you feel like it should be the hours of exercise? All right, those who say hours of exercise are correct. Would anyone like to just motivate why you, how do you know it's hours of exercise? Yeah? Yes, so she said the um, hours of exercise will impact or determine your percentage body fat, but your body fat doesn't have an impact on your hours of exercise. Okay, so that's really typically how you look at it. So most of the time it's very clear. So it's not something that students get confused. So I don't worry, don't worry about that. You all know you'll be fine. Okay, so now we've spoken about the two types of variables, independent, dependent, and this is how you're going to plot it. So we're saying we're interested in looking at the relationship between these two variables, and there are different kinds of relationships, specifically deterministic and probabilistic. So I want to now make it clear for you what's the difference if you say two variables have a deterministic relationship versus if they have a probabilistic relationship. All right, so a deterministic relationship is pretty much a case where if x is known, then y is also known completely. So what I have here is an example. So um, these points all fall on the line y is equal to 2x. So I took different values of x, x equal to 0, 1, 2, all the way up to 5, and then I plug them in the equation. And then I got y is equal to double the value of x. Okay, so in all of these cases, all of these points lie on the line y is equal to 2x. So when you have a deterministic relationship, if I give you the value of x, you can with confidence tell me what the value of y is. So there is absolutely no uncertainty or randomness. You have absolute confidence that if I give you x, you can tell me what y is completely. You know it. Another example would be y is equal to the square root of x. So you see everything lies perfectly on a line. So if I give you x, you'll be able to tell me y with absolute certainty. So this is when you have a deterministic relationship. It's going to look something like this. So we're not really interested so much in this case because it's obvious and it's very clear and straightforward. We're actually more interested in cases where it's not so straightforward. So that's where you have a non-deterministic or a probabilistic relationship. Okay. So here, um, in this graph, what I've done is I've just taken a toy example where I have a whole bunch of students, and then for each student, I recorded whatever the mark they got was, uh, in a quiz out of 30, and then I also um, got the corresponding student's exam score. So here, immediately when you look at it, you can see there is a relationship between quiz score and exam score, right? You can see that. This is not real data. It's not taken from anything. So yeah, don't read too much into it. So what we're seeing here is you've got this trend. And we're seeing that typically, in general, what we're seeing is happening here is the higher a student's quiz score, the higher the exam score. Okay, so you see this upward trend here. So pretty much that means if I tell you a, a student's mark, let's say they got 20 out of 30, you'll be able to make a fairly good guess about what the exam score is. But you can see all the points don't lie on the line, so you can't say so with absolute certainty. So that's the difference in the deterministic versus the non-deterministic case. There's a little bit of uncertainty that comes in. So let's start off with this example. Let's say a student got a quiz score of 10. 
All right, so they got 10 out of 30. So if I ask you, okay, what would you expect the exam score to be? If you just use these observations, you can immediately see that you have a student who got 10, but then got 20% in the exam. And then you have another student who got the same quiz score, but then got 60% in the exam. So it's not a straightforward case. There is some randomness that we're observing here. Similarly, let's say we look at students who got 20 out of 30. You have one student who got maybe about 50%. And then the other one got 80%, even though they both had 20 out of 30. So you have this scenario where things are not so straightforward, and now you have this randomness. So here are further examples that you could look at in reality. So I think this one is from the textbook. Um, if X is the age of a child, so um, we, we're interested in seeing how big are our students' vocabulary. So age, um, X is your age, and Y is the size of the child's vocabulary. So imagine if you go to a preschool and you go get a bunch of six-year-olds. Um, would you expect them to all have the same um, size of vocabulary? What other things could, imp could impact the person's size of vocabulary other than the student's age? Suggestions? Yes? OK, he says personality type could have an impact. Any other ideas? Yeah? Demographic, perhaps? Yeah, especially if it's not your first language and we're looking at English, for example. Yeah. Maybe? Maybe even the parents' vocabulary. So imagine if your parents only speak to you with five words, is it likely you have more than five words? Yeah, so there are a lot of different factors. So you can see actually when we plot the line, the randomness that's coming, it's from these other factors that we haven't accounted for. Okay, so you'll see it a little, I'll keep going back to that point. Another thing, I'm sure maybe this one you've observed, where X could be whatever grades you've got in a trick, and then Y is your university grades. So I could get a whole bunch of you who got 90s in a trick, and then if I look at you, are you all getting 90s here as well? I'll leave that to you. You know yourselves where you're sitting, but there's randomness there, and we can even attribute the same thing. You went to different school, maybe you had different study methods. There's all sorts of things that would have an impact on why you have random variation in reality. Okay. All right. So, have you managed to grasp the difference between your deterministic case and your non-deterministic case? All right. So. The key difference is if x is known, then there is still some uncertainty about y in the probabilistic case, whereas the other one, you knew it completely. And then another thing that we can also observe um, is for any fixed x. So let's say I focus on, let's say, um, kids who are age four, and I'm interested in the vocabulary. So if I fix, and I'll only look at the four-year-olds, then y is a random variable. So the size of the vocabulary is going to be different. So there's going to be randomness. And you know, whenever we talk about random variables, we also talk about distribution. So we're going to focus on that in the next few slides. We're going to talk about what's the distribution of this y. OK. So hopefully that is clear. Are there any questions before I move on? All right, so are you understanding why I say that when you fix the at and x, you have variation in y? Y is a random variable. Okay, so like in this case, I focused on x is equal to 20, and I didn't get one specific y. I got this y, there could have been another one here, another one there. So y has its own distribution because it's a random variable. Okay. All right. So when we spoke about what's the objective of regression, it is to investigate the relationship between two more variables. And now we can add this part that we're actually interested in when they have a relationship when it's non-deterministic. Okay, so hopefully you saw the deterministic case is very straightforward, but in reality, life is not that simple. There's more things that will affect a variable than just the one. So we're more interested, completely interested in the non-deterministic case. So if I go back to the example of your quiz score and your exam score, and I just plot this line through here. So I just sketched a line, and I picked... Um, the equation of this line is y is equal to 4x minus 10. 
And in this line, there is absolutely no randomness. The moment I give you an x, you give me a definite value of y. So this is a deterministic model. So what we're going to do in the next slide, we're going to add a little part to this equation to account for the extra randomness that we're observing. Okay. Okay, so now we're going to get a little bit more technical. This is in your textbook. This is pretty much your first definition that you need to know. Um, so we can just have a quick read here. It says, this is how you define. This formula here is how you define the simple linear regression model. So let's just have a look at what the statement says. It's from the textbook. It says there are parameters beta 0, beta 1, and sigma squared such that for any fixed value of the independent variable x, the dependent variable is related to x through the model equation as follows. So remember this first part, beta 0 plus beta 1 x, it represents a deterministic line. But we're saying the points aren't lying on that line. It's a bit of randomness. So we add this extra term. So this curvy E, have you seen it before? Have you used it? OK, so that's epsilon. Um, if you hear me say epsilon, I'm just referring to the curly little E there. So the epsilon is there to account for the randomness from the line. OK, so before, if you ignore that epsilon, just drop it for now. And you just focus on the part where you have y is equal to beta 0 plus beta 1x. You have that deterministic model. And we refer to this line as the true regression model. So in other words, this line is the, it represents the true relationship between x and y. Okay, But I know in practice we see this randomness. And that randomness is coming from other factors that we haven't accounted for. So if you look at the example of, let's say, the age and the student's vocabulary, you guys gave me other things that could have impacted the student's vocabulary. But this model, um, it doesn't account for that. I'm only looking at how age impacts the size of vocabulary. So the, all this randomness is coming from those other things that we didn't account for, such as the size of the parent's vocabulary, demographic, and all those things that you mentioned. Okay, so you have this line, the true regression line, and if you wanted to get a particular point, so let's look at x1, y1 here, you can model all of these points, as a matter of fact, using this line. So what I'm saying is all of these points, they're deviating from this line by a certain amount. So we usually recur, we refer to it as a random deviation or a random error. So that's your epsilons here. So all of these points, since they don't lie on the line, they'll have their own epsilon. So let's say you have x1 and y1. If you put them in the line, OK, so just in the true regression line, you have a point here exactly on the line. But then now adding that epsilon 1 will get you to the actual value that we observed. So this is pretty much how you model each point in theory. And then now, let's have a look at the different elements of this equation quickly. So hopefully you know from calculus that beta 0 is your y-intercept. That's familiar, right? Nothing new there. OK, so simply it tells you what's the value of y going to be when x is equal to 0. And then beta 1, it's also a constant. This is your gradient. So it's also what you've done before. Um, your gradient tells you also just taking back. So in this context, the gradient tells you um, by how much y will increase with a one unit increase in x. So if x goes up by one unit, then you know y will go up by beta 1, because you're saying x times beta 1. So um, in other words, um, I wrote it in here. Yeah. So beta 1 is the guaranteed increase in y when x increases by 1 unit. OK, are you happy with that statement? All right, so you know, like I said, if x increases by 1 unit, then y will also go up by beta 1, because you say 1 times beta 1. And then this epsilon, I said it's called your random deviation, or it's your random error. So it accounts for the difference between the line and your points. Okay. 
All right, are there any questions up until this point? Are you happy so far? Yes. Um, what, what are you questioning? Which part? Like when I'm saying the guaranteed increase? So, so what I'm going to know is like if we set x to any value, then y becomes a random variable, right? Yeah, y is a random variable because the epsilon is so random. We can't, so you said that the y intercept is equal to zero because epsilon is no unit, right? Is there beta zero plus epsilon? Yeah. Okay. So the beta zero. Yeah, okay. So don't don't stress about it. Okay. All right. Yeah. All right. So what I wanted to highlight is um, now we make three assumptions when we use a regression model. So before I give you the assumptions, so remember when we were looking at the standard limit theorem, you were saying x bar would have a normal distribution and it's approximately normal under what conditions? Large sample size. That's correct. Is that familiar? Okay, you don't necessarily need it directly, but I just want to connect it with what we're doing here. So all the theory that we're going to study, please stop talking, in this section is going to be valid under specific assumptions. So just like the central limit theorem is only valid when you have a large sample size. Here, all the theory is dependent on certain characteristics. So there are three assumptions, and I've highlighted them in red. So the one assumption is you're assuming that for each pair of x and y values, they're going to be independent. So the moment you have dependence, then you can't use all the theory that we're doing in chapter 12. So linear regression, everything we're doing only applies in this scenario here. So I'm not saying x and y are independent. Remember, we're saying they have a relationship. I'm saying if I take an xy value for myself and xy value is for another student, those pairs are independent. So my values are kind of your values and your values, etc. But in themselves, x and y will have a connection. Okay? And then the other assumption we're making is that these epsilons here, they follow a normal distribution with mean zero, and they all have the same variance, sigma squared. So if this, if any of these assumptions are violated, you cannot use this linear regression model that we're going to be studying for the next two weeks. And then the last property is that um, the epsilons are independent for all values of x. All right, so remember each of these x values um, will have an epsilon. There's epsilon 1, epsilon 2, up to n, and they're going to be independent of each other. There shouldn't be any relationship. Okay. And then something that I forgot to mention at the end is just when we talk about um, linear regression, because it's a straight line, that's why we talk about it as being linear. And we're studying pretty much the simplest form of regression. So that's where the name is coming from. So simple linear regression. Because um, you can have other relationships. It's not always going to be a straight line. You can have a parabola. You can have... You can have something that's quadratic. You can have all sorts of different relationships between things, but we're only focusing on the ones where a straight line applies. Okay, so that's where this whole term of simple linear regression comes from. All right, are there any questions? Anything that's not clear that you want me to clarify? Okay. All right, so in your textbook, um, you can have a look at examples 12.2 and 12.1 as a self-study. I'm not going to look at them myself, but you should be fine if you're okay. Okay. So before I go into this slide, just to tell you where we're going from here. So remember I was telling you, if you fix the value of x, y is a random variable. And we want to look at what's the distribution of y. So just to re-emphasize the same point, I'm saying here, okay, let's say I focus on x is equal to 0. Then all these y's, you can get many different possibilities for y. So there's randomness in y, so that's why I use a capital letter 
y on the x. And you're going to find that, okay, if you look at it sideways, these y values actually follow a normal distribution. And similarly for all the other points as well, the moment you fix x and you focus on the y values only, then under the assumptions that we gave just now, then that means y is going to follow a normal distribution. Okay, and you'll see it's actually going to be the same normal, the same variance on all of them. They'll just be different means, obviously, because one has the mean there, one has the mean there. So what I want to do in the next slide or two is to just um, show you why I say y has a normal distribution. So this is the result that we're going to focus on in the next slide or two. So I'm saying y, given some specific value, I'm going to call it x star follows a normal distribution with this mean and that variance. So this mean is simply given by this formula, and I'll be able to prove it for you just now. And then the variance is the sigma squared there. Um, this is the same sigma squared that that epsilon had as its variance. So we will see just now. So all these normal distributions will have the same spread, but they'll have a different mean. All right. And then the mean is given by beta 0 plus beta 1 times whatever the x star that you have been given. Okay. Okay. Are you fine? Can I move on? Yes. X star. X star is just a specific value that we've chosen. So in this case, x star is equal to 0. This one, x star is equal to 1. So it's just the one that you're focusing on. That's all. So it's just representing a specific value of x. Okay, so now I'm going to show you why I say y given x star follows a normal distribution with those parameters. Okay, so the first thing we need to decide is what's the distribution. So if you didn't know, you just start off by looking at this formula here for y. Okay. So what you need to remember when you look at this is remember beta 0 is a constant, it's your intercept. Beta 1 is also a constant, it's your slope. And then x, if I give you a specific x star, then it's also going to be a constant. And then epsilon is a random variable with a normal distribution with those parameters. So those are the key things you need to remember here. So now if I wanted to find the distribution y given x star, then if I look at this formula, Remember I said beta 0 is a constant, beta 1 is a constant, and when I put x star, it's a constant. So this whole part, beta 0 plus beta 1x, gives you a constant. So you end up with, sorry, okay, so you end up with a constant plus epsilon, all right? So, but remember, epsilon follows a normal distribution. So that's why I have here, I say y is equal to c plus a normally distributed random variable, which is your epsilon. Okay, so remember a linear combination of normally distributed random variables is also normal, right? Are you happy with that? Yes. A constant. Okay, all right. So. Pretty much, what would it be? when you draw that linear regression line, it's not going to be random. It's going to be a straight line. So that means the intercept and the slope, they remain the same. Is that fine with you? So it's literally, if I look at, for example, here, I'm just giving you a fixed straight line. So that means, the, let's say in this case, your beta 0 would be minus 10 and your beta 1 would be 4. Okay, we'll look at how to calculate them in the next lecture. But when you calculate them, you always get a fixed value. So is that fine? So beta 0, beta 1 are constants. Now, I'm saying here, if I focus on a particular value of x, right? So I give you, let's say x is equal to 2, which is this part here. Then is there any randomness there? If I tell you x is equal to 2. I've just told you, like if I tell you guys, hypothetically speaking, let's say I am 19 years old. Is there any doubt if I tell you I am 19? Will you, and I'm, and I'm trustworthy, assume I'm trustworthy. 
So I am trustworthy and you know I'm not lying. Is there any randomness in that scenario? It's fixed. It's a fixed value. I am 19. <laughs> you guys don't look like you believe me. <laughs> All right. But if I told you that, okay, I'm somewhere between, let's say, 20 and 30. Okay, you're not going to know exactly which age I am. There's some randomness there. But the moment I give you a fixed value, so even if you think back to conditional probability, if I say y given x is equal to 4, you always took x is equal to 4. It's known, so there's no randomness there. So this is just a conditional probability. So you know x star. And remember, we're focusing on a specific x star, not x in general. So the moment you have x star fixed, beta 1 fixed and beta 0 fixed, then this whole part of the equation, excluding the epsilon, is a constant. Okay? Are you happy with that? And then the epsilon bit is going to be random, because remember, everyone deviates a little bit from the line by just different values, and it's, it's going to be random, those epsilons. So remember from the previous graph here, let me just open it for you, um, where we plotted the epsilons here. You see, this person will have that epsilon one. This one will have an even bigger one. This one will have a tiny one. They're all epsilons. They're all different. So they're random. And I've told you we're assuming that they have a normal distribution, and these are the parameters. Okay. So epsilon itself is a random variable. So what we have in our case is we're taking a constant, which is those first two terms, and we're just adding it to a normally distributed random variable. So all we're doing is we're just doing a translation. You have a normal curve, and you just add a constant. So you're either moving it to the right or to the left on your number line. Okay, so ultimately that means y, because it's just a translation of a normally distributed random variable, will also have a normally distributed random variable distribution, sorry. And if you go back to the theory that we've done, we said a linear combination of normally distributed random variables is equal, is also going to be normally distributed. So this is also just a linear combination. Okay, so the coefficient of the normally distributed random variable is 1, and then we're just adding a constant. Okay. Is it clear? Yes. 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 Okay, so just to repeat what she said, so she was saying, so basically, the beta 0 plus beta 1 times x star is your c, and the epsilon is your normal random variable, which is correct. So if you understood it that way, you are on point. And then, because all the epsilons are independent, then we also conclude that all the y's are independent as well. Okay. Okay, are we together now? Are we fine with that? Everyone's cool. I said it, I've motivated why it's normal. All right, so with a normal distribution, you need the variance and you need the mean. So let's look at the variance. So if I wanted the variance of y given x star, all right, so in other words, it's this equation here, but with x star in it. So remember, we, we're looking at the case where x is given and it's x star. So x star is a constant, all right? So hopefully you can see now um, why I get a zero for the variance of beta zero, that's because it's a constant, and the variance of beta when x star is also going to be zero because it's a constant. And then epsilon is the only random variable, and we said it has a normal distribution with parameter equal to sigma squared. So you end up with a variance equal to sigma squared for all of x. Alright, any questions there? Is that, are you happy with that? Okay, so the implications of all these y given x stars having the same variance means that all the points should lie approximately between parallel lines because the spread is supposed to be the same at each value of x. So, for example, you know, before you do regression, you'll typically plot your graph, and if you see that these lines are not that your points don't really lie between parallel lines. Maybe they fan out, you know, making like a trumpet thing. Then you don't want to use all the theory in this chapter six for linear regression because it's not satisfying um, the requirements of the model. Because we said the epsilons all have the same variance, and this variance is the same as the y. So immediately you can see if this is different for different values of y, then the epsilons will also be different for different values of y. Okay, so 
In a nutshell, all the points should lie between parallel lines. They shouldn't fan out, shouldn't curve, but just two lines like this. Okay. And then your sigma represents a typical deviation from the mean. So we'll look at the mean just now. And this is something you know. Any questions? Are you happy with how I got the variance? Okay, so let's get the mean now. So same way we did it. Um, I want the expected value of y given x star. So in here, I think I should have put y given x star to make it clear, but I, it's, that's what I meant to write. So remember, we're taking the expectation of this thing. So the expected value of beta 0 is just beta 0 because it's a constant. The expected value of beta 1 x star is also just beta 1 x star because it's a constant. And then the only randomness comes from your epsilon. And we know the expected value of epsilon is 0. OK. Is that fine? So let's just um, talk about this notation quickly that you'll see in the book. So you know when we have the mean of y, we write mu subscript y. So it's the same logic here. We're interested in the mean of y given x star. So in the subscript, that's why I put y given x star. And then if you look at the graph, let's say we focused on x equal to y. So that's specifically this column here. Then the expected value your mu with subscript y given 1 is just the value in the middle. Remember, it's your location. And then you expect that the values will be concentrated here. And as you go further and further away, there will be less and less values there because of this normal curve that we have. So for each and every point here, you'll see once again here, that's the mean for those y values for that fixed value of x equal to 2. And even here, if you look at x equal to 3, it also has its own mean. Okay. All right, so we'll see just now that actually our linear regression line goes through these points. It joins all those means. Okay, so in this next slide, um, I have this question for you. Yeah. Sorry, I just want to know why does the expected value of the epsilon go to zero? Because epsilon follows a normal distribution with expected value zero. So that's why the expected value of epsilon is zero. So you're taking everything from here. It's just copy from there and you just put it in. Okay, so don't do anything else. All right. All right, so we'll be done just now. We'll get as far as I want to get for today. Um, so the question I pose here is what if we drew a line joining all those means? So remember we had that star here and a star here and a star there. We're going to see just now that this true regression line that we spoke about earlier joins all those stars. So remember we said this equation is called the population or true regression line. I think I've added population here. Yeah, so we've got the population regression line or the true regression line which shows you the true relationship between y and x. Um, if there was no randomness, no other factors affecting your variables, this would be the true relationship. And just now, we saw that the expected value of y given x star is equal to beta 0 plus beta 1 x star. So this is just from the previous slide. Remember here at the bottom, the result we got beta 0 plus beta 1 x star. So I just copied it here, beta 0 plus beta 1 x star. OK. Are we OK? All right. So you can see that these lines are exactly the same. Beta 0, beta 0, beta 1, beta 1. This is just a point on the line. So specifically, if I give you x star, then this just gives you a point on the same line. So that's why I'm saying these expected values, so let's say x star is equal to 1 which gives you mu y given 1 there. That's just the point on this line where x star is equal to 1. And if you look at all the other points, this linear regression line is just joining the expected values. OK. So in other words, in your textbook, there's this line here that says the slope parameter beta 1 is now interpreted as the expected or true average because of this, now you know that this line here um, it joins the averages of respected values. You can think of it as 
giving you the expected or true average increase in y associated with one unit increase in x. Okay, so while you're just copying quickly, so remember I said here, x tells you um, the guaranteed increase in y when x increased by one unit. So similarly, you see that it's just the same wording here. So now it's the expected increase in y with a one unit in x because you know it's equal to the expected value. All right, are there any questions? Okay, so I want us to just stop here so that we can do your semester tests. Um, there will be a video for you. It's already up, so you can already start your candidates.